it's really a wonderful, it's really a, a blessing to be here because you all, your, your guilt has helped us the monastery out so much over the years. Uh, have any of you, any of you here, were you part of the original bus that came in 1968 with Mother Alexandra's first pilgrimage? Anybody come on that bus? We're too young. <laughs> Not surprising. Um, but your guild has actually been part of, of our monastery's history ever since its very beginning. The first pilgrimage that Mother Alexandra had, she was our foundress. She had a trailer, and that was it on the whole property. That was just that was, that was total, the total amount of the, the property was a, a, a little trailer. And the first pilgrimage was in the trailer, <laughs> and so for the feast day. Uh, and ever since then, for many years, you all brought a bus. Uh, and I, probably some of you were, have, have come on those buses. To, to visit us, and, and that's a, a tradition that if you want to revive that, we would be really happy. It would be really nice to have you, have you come. So we want to give a long-standing, many years overdue, thank you for everything that you've done for us uh, since long before I've been in the monastery. And so it's just a, it's a delight to, to be here, and, and I bring Mother Christopher's greetings, and the greetings from the other sisters, too. And uh, so, uh, so tonight, as Kathy said, she's, I, I have this little booklet that was written, and uh, she asked if I would talk about the, the things that are in it. And I, before I do that, I want to talk just a minute about how it came to be written, because that's not in there. Um, in 1995, my father passed away, and uh, he had chosen to be cremated. And that was something that I didn't want him to do, but I never got around to talking to him about it. And then all of a sudden he died. And I had no choice but to sign off. I mean, I was there, and some of the, the other, my other siblings were there, and we had to put, the siblings that were there had to sign off at the uh, funeral home or they wouldn't have done it. And I, I just had no choice. It was really not, it was really a difficult thing for me to do. So it made me think about, well, what is the whole, what is our whole understanding, our orthodox understanding of the body, the death, how that all works together, resurrection, how those things all kind of come together. So writing this book was really part of my grieving process. So um, to, to come to terms with that. And so that was, uh, uh, so it was really a, a, a gift for me. And then Concilia Press decided they'd like to publish it. So that was nice too. So anyway, um, I, we have a few books here. I didn't have too many in stock, unfortunately, but they're, they're, they're pretty readily, I think they're readily available, although we, they might be out of print, we're not sure. But at any rate, there's a couple of them over there. So what we're going to look, this, the subject of death is a huge subject, uh, and, I, and I really I really need you to, we have a, a series of lectures that Father Thomas Hopko did about death, he's got, we got four CDs, and I think you probably just got going. <laughs> so, you know, you can teach a whole semester class on it, and so it's a very uh, in-depth, uh, I mean, the subject is, is, can be got, come at from so many different ways, and obviously we don't, we don't have that much time today. So what we're going to we're going to do some overview. I'm going to take some of what I say out of from from the booklet, uh, but a lot not. I mean, um, so if you want to get a fuller because the book's too long for one lecture a, a booklet, and um, so if you want a fuller uh, understanding, you can uh, get a hold of the book. Maybe you can share with the ones that we have. But what, we're, what we'll look at today, uh, we'll start out with some societal views of death, and we're going to be particularly focusing on the body. Because that's what, in cremation, that's what happens, right? You, you burn the body. Um, and so that's going to be the, the, the main uh, sort of subcategory of death that we talk about. And we will, in, in order to do that, we'll look, about, look at some ways other societies view death and what they do. And then we'll look at the Bible and what does the Bible teach? The Old Testament, the New Testament, particularly the words of Christ, and um, go on to an Orthodox understanding of, the, of death, the body, the resurrection. And then we're going to finish with what, uh, uh, we'll, we'll also do some things about the Orthodox burial services and our, our customs. And then we'll finish with what good can thinking about death to for me now in my life right now. So how can I use the fact that I'm going to die to the good in my life? 
kind of live that out. Um, so we'll start out, I'm going to start by a, a quote by Father Alexander Schmemann. He says, truth is the criterion. The purpose of Christianity is not to help people by reconciling them with death, but to reveal the truth about life and death in order that people may be saved by this truth. Now, in our culture today, we have this thing about death. I, one time, it was several years ago, I went to a service. It was not an Orthodox service. A friend of ours that died. And the preacher was up there, and obviously an older man, so he's been a, a, a priest a long time. And he was going, he was going on and on about how death is natural. It's something that we get used to. It's something you don't have to, you don't have to be upset about it. It's something that happens, and, and this kind of milk toast <laughs> sort of approach to it. And then he was followed by another priest, who obviously, uh, when he had had five best friends, close friends died within the, the last year of this particular this funeral. And he had a very different understanding. So what Father Schmemann is talking about, we're not trying to reconcile with death, we're trying to understand it and, um, and, and approach it in an orthodox way. So death, death for us, is, it's not just some kind of a biological transformation from being into nothingness. We just go into the ground and we disintegrate and that's it. Nothing left to us. Um, we're not, it's not some kind of where we, the soul gets absorbed into this cosmic seed. These are other cultures that, that, that talk about this. Um, it's not sort of a dark passageway that leads from this life to another world. So time has, uh, death has been, every single culture that's ever been, death has been a central thing, a central experience, and, a, and a, something that needed to be understood and come to terms with. And whether it's a philosopher or a scientist or a theologian, people from all walks of life have, have been studying and trying to understand this. Because obviously it's something that everybody has to deal with. Um, so this present one is not so much about death itself, it's about how we can affirm life. The teaching of the church, in the teaching of the church, and St. Paul is very clear about this, death is an enemy to be defeated. Death is the last enemy. So death is not something nice. It's an, it's an enemy. It's not something. I remember when my father died, I felt like my own soul and body had been torn apart. It was, a, it was just a, it didn't last very long. Good, thank God. But it was, it was really a, an awful experience. Um, so it's, death is, it is seen, it's a foe, and it stands between us and this experience, this existence, which Christ has promised us through his passion. St. Paul speaks, these are some of the most powerful words about death in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that whole chapter has to do with death. This is a few sentences. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal, mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Christ Jesus. Now, in terms of the way different cultures have looked at death, it kind of helps to understand how different cultures do it, so it helps us to understand how we do it. And um, the customs, what, what you find is when you take a look at a different society and, and you figure out, well, how do they deal with their dead? What do they do with a dead person? That t uh, tells you a lot about their view of who the, what a person is and uh, what death means and the, whether or not there is an afterlife. There are a lot of ancient cultures that believe that life continued after death in the same way that it was before. It was just in a different place. So this you get the, the, the ancient Egyptians, for instance, in the pyramids. And when somebody died, like the king died, he was, he or the pharaoh, he was surrounded by everything he would need in the afterlife. They put food, they put animals, they put his wife they, in there to die with him. They put servants, <laughs> slaves in there, uh, money, everything. They provided him with everything he could need. And we find that when, the, when they have to open the, pharaoh, the pharaoh's tombs, that's what they found. So, and this is, so these are people that, that would, uh, 
that would consider that life after death is something the same, it's just in another place. Now the Hindu practice, the Hindus cremate, and they do it on a funeral pyre. So they build a big pyre, and they set it up, the first the top, they set it on fire. And there, for them, um, the act, this act of cremation is very logical in terms of their belief of what the relationship is between soul and body. In Hindu teaching, there's two words for soul. One word is Atman, and one word is Jiva. And Jiva is the individual soul that I would call in this body, Mother Magdalene. So it's my, it's my personality in this particular life. My, that's that's my, the soul in this life. The word Atman, which for them is by far the, by far the most important, is the quote unquote real soul. And this is not an individualized soul, but just the opposite. It's the, it's the part that, that goes from one life to another until you, thousands of lives, you've reached this state of uh, samadhi or nirvana where your, your, this Atman is completely dissolved into this great cosmic consciousness. And there is no individual sense left. So the Hindus have no sense of the person, personality existing beyond this life, except for this oversoul, which goes on. So with that kind of an understanding, what difference does the body make? It just, you, you, the soul drops the body, and you have nothing else to do with it, so let's burn it and, and um, do away with it. So, um, so that's the, uh, uh, the, the the Hindu, the, the uh, Greco-Roman, the ancient uh, Roman Greece was somewhat similar. They also cremated their dead, but they uh, they they claimed that they didn't have quite the same understanding of the soul. But they claimed that the that, that the real person is only the soul, and the soul is the only thing. You were if you were an ancient Greek or Roman or Plato, you would you are a, you were a soul that had a body, and the body was a cage. And it kept the soul from going off into these flights of this sort of philosophical flights of, of ecstasy. And so the whole point was you had to shed the body in order that the soul could rise to, to the heights that it was supposed to have. So the soul uses the body as an instrument. It's um, it, just, like they, just like the engineer and the engine. So you have an engineer that's the soul, and then the engine, which is this thing that gets used, and then it's it's uh, uh, discarded. And cremation, for them, symbolized the utter hopelessness of the world. It was actually a mark of despair. Death was the end of material life. So um, cremation, this which was widely practiced throughout the ancient world, this act of reducing the body to ashes. Um, today it's done in special furnaces using an extremely high heat. We'll get a little bit more of that later. And it's increasingly practiced in part it's due because of the influence that Hinduism and Buddhism, Eastern philosophies have had on our culture. That's, and that's part of it, but it's also the eroding of the traditional beliefs among uh, non-Christians and also even Christians. In many Christian denominations, at least in the, the liberal ones, they don't require their uh, members anymore to believe in the, the empty tomb. They don't require them to believe in Christ's physical resurrection. They, they call the empty tomb a myth, and they, re, they reduce all the post-resurrections of Jesus to purely spiritual experiences. And this is what a priest, uh, Father Patrick Reardon, some of you may know him or his, well, his books, this is the way he describes this trend. The Christian funeral service, the, is widely being replaced by the Protestant, quote, memorial service, unquote, at which mourners gather not to be myrrh bearers, not to provide the last ministry to a Christian body in preparation for the resurrection, but to, quote, remember, unquote, the deceased who has just been vaporized in the interests of a more efficient and economic disposal. That sort of memorial service is ra a rather loud and impressive proclamation that the body is of no great importance which is about the least Christian thing anybody can possibly say about the body. Now in contrast to these views, the Orthodox Church has traditionally rejected cremation because it's diametrically opposed to the expectation of the resurrection of the dead in Christ. Orthodox theology teaches that the Son of God was also truly man, 
a physical, real man, which there were heresies that said that he wasn't. He was just a, sort of kind of an apparition, apparition, but we teach that he was a real, physical man. Uh, he was raised, his whole human nature, body and soul, were raised when he raised. If the resurrection is just a legend or a beautiful metaphor, then as St. Paul says, if Christ is not risen, your faith is in vain. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Therefore, the cremation has always been rejected by the church, and, and that's clearly shown by her scripture, theology, and tradition. 